All right, Psalm 79, there's a, another similar theme that we've dealt with in the past. We're going to dig into this one, uh, starting in verse number one. The Bible reads, O God, the heathen are come into thine inheritance, thy holy temple have they defiled. They have laid Jerusalem on heaps. Now, this is another prophetic psalm because at this time, this is a psalm of Asaph and this is around, you know, written around the time of King David and, and his men singers and Asaph was one of those men. So he, he lived, you know, a long time previous and we're going to see here a mention of the temple, which the temple isn't even built until Solomon uh, has it constructed, right? It's been planned. Uh, David had wanted to do it. He got all the supplies and things ready for it. So as we read this, the first, we already know when he's talking about the heathen coming into God's inheritance, right? Well, if it's coming into God's inheritance, it must literally be talking about his physical inheritance, not the heavenly Jerusalem, not heaven, because the heathen aren't ever going to enter there. So they're, they're going to enter into the physical inheritance and God's holy temple, it says, have they defiled, they have laid Jerusalem on heap. So this is referring to a time in the future where that destruction is going to come. And I pointed this out many times in the past. I'll continue to point it out that I believe with many of the prophecies in Scripture that they are applied or applicable um, oftentimes more than once. So you have, you have different uh, settings or different applications of the, of a same prophecy that can be fulfilled more than once. You kind of have, a, a, you know, what we call it dual prophecies or even, you know, triple prophecies depending on, on the situation or circumstance. So what I mean by that, and, and we'll go into this a little bit more, we'll use some supporting scripture and we see how things are described in other places in the Bible. But one prophecy of, of the temple being destroyed is when the children of Israel are taken captive by the Babylonian Empire. So when they are removed from the land, the temple is destroyed. And then you have the second temple when they go after the 70 years of captivity, they go back into the land and then they rebuild the temple. And then, uh, um, you know, that ends up getting destroyed in 70 AD with the Romans, the Roman Empire, right? But then we also know that there is going to be another temple that's built that is going to fulfill prophecy that hasn't been fulfilled yet, even though there is much prophecy talking about these temples being destroyed and, and God's inheritance, things like that. Um, there is also uh, events that have not happened yet that still have reference to a temple and sacrifices and things like that. So um, I, I'm not going to get super in-depth on that, but just to sort of lay that, that initial groundwork in your mind as we go through these uh, verses, that this is pretty common to see those, those events. And even, you know, if you're familiar with Matthew 24, Mark 13, when disciples asked Jesus, you know, because uh, Jesus said, hey, do you see these, you know, they see this, they're saying, hey, look at this great temple, right? The disciples say, hey, look at, can you believe this great temple? And, I, and of course, I'm paraphrasing here. They're, they're kind of marveling at the temple and he says, you know, there's not going to be one stone left upon another here. The, the temple is going to be completely destroyed. And then they ask like, well, hey, when are these things going to be, when are you coming back, and what's going to be the sign of your coming? So there's multiple things then that Jesus throughout Matthew 24 gives descriptions of. So he talks about the short-term destruction. He also talks about the, the end times too, right before his return back to this earth. So he gives different information about different time periods, but it's all prophetic from that point. And Similarly, we can see that in the Old Testament as well, that there's going to be prophecies. And I've covered this. You go through the Psalm series. If you haven't been here already, uh, there's many places where we see that taking place, where we see some partial fulfillments of, of, of prophecy. And obviously, not, it, you know, we can look back and say, well, it doesn't seem like everything has been fulfilled. That's because there's still uh, more events to come in the future. So let's, with that all being said, let's take a look at this because this is clearly talking about a destruction in God's inheritance, the holy temple being defiled, laying Jerusalem on heaps. That's verse number one. Verse number two, the dead bodies of thy servants 
have they given to be meat unto the fowls of the heaven, the flesh of thy saints unto the beasts of the earth. Now, verse 2 references God's servants, and then it calls his saints. So this isn't just talking about like a physical Israel of a chosen people, but literally talking about God's people that would be the spiritual seed, that those are the, the spiritual children of Abraham here that are believers, because that is how you are a saint. You are sanctified. You know, you are, you are the redeemed of God. So not everyone who was a physical Jew or physically of Israel was a spiritual Jew because they put their trust in the Lord, right? Uh, but this is referring to people who know they are followers of the Lord. They are believers in that sense and that they are going to be destroyed at the time that's being prophesied here uh, with that temple. Verse number three, their blood have they shed like water round about Jerusalem and there was none to bury them. And uh, just keep that phrase in mind. We're going to see another reference similar to this. Verse number four, we are become a reproach to our neighbors, a scorn and derision to them that are round about us. How long, Lord, wilt thou be angry forever? Shall thy jealousy burn like fire. Now, there's kind of a lot of things going on here. That's why I like the Bible studies. We take the time to just dig into the verses and see what's going on. So we see that there is judgment coming and there's going to be people that are even, the, you know, the saints or God's people who are being destroyed here. And it says there's going to be no one to even bury them. And that's going to be because no one cares, right? No one's going to care about them at all. Which is why that verse 3 is followed up with verse 4 saying, we're become a reproach to our neighbors, right? People despise them. People don't care at all about them. They're a reproach. They're a scorn of the derision to all the people around them. So um, we can, we, we see many prophecies of this to come in the end times where um, there's going to be a lot of martyrs for Christ. There's going to be a lot of people who are um, killed because of Christ, there's going to be a lot of believers who are, I believe, going to be meeting a condition similar to this. But then we also see this, uh, you know, verse 5 says, how long, Lord? And we'll get into that as well, where God's people are asking, you know, God, how long is it going to be before you judge because of everything that's happening to us? Because the heathen are uh, destroying us and killing us here. But then it says this, wilt thou be angry forever? So, this is coming from the perspective of a believer, but, the, but they're applying the anger to, them, to themselves, right? And saying, are you going to be angry forever? Shall thy jealousy burn like fire? Well, now, why would God be jealous? Well, when does God be jealous? Is when the people go after other gods, right? So when God's own people are starting to go after these idols and, and lift up altars, other gods and things like that, this is when God gets angry. And this is exactly what happened at the first destru the, the destruction of the first temple because they were building up altars to other gods. Uh, Manasseh was one of the worst ones that built up all these altars and uh, had his children pass through the fire unto Baal and, and all kinds of wickedness was going on in the land during that time. And he was one of the last kings of Judah is in that last era right before um, the, the captivity. Of course, Josiah came up was his grandson, but and, and did a lot of great things and really served the Lord mightily. But God even said, he's like, even though you followed me with all of your heart and, and has done things that no one had done before, none of the kings in Israel and the way that he followed him, uh, like very similar to David, followed the Lord with his heart. But it still wasn't enough because of what Manasseh had done was so bad. He's just like, the, the judgment's coming. All you did was extend the time before the judgment comes because, you know, God respected what Josiah was doing and appreciated that. But he's like, it's still, it's still coming, right? It's not going to come in your days, but it is, it is coming down, down the road. And, um, and it was because of all of the wickedness and ultimately the people turning their back. And sometimes what we don't get and this is a little bit of a side note, but just something to think about when you're reading your Bible and doing studies on your own. When we read through the books of Kings and Chronicles, 
you learn a lot about the kings, about the rulers, about the leaders, and about the prophets. So you could read about Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Elijah, Elisha, these men of God that coexisted during these times of the kings. And you could kind of see things from different perspectives, but oftentimes you see the actions of one person, but that one person, don't forget. Now look, the, the impact of one person is tremendous and can be very tremendous with God. God's looking for one person, but just because you may have one good king doesn't mean that the heart of the people is always with the Lord, right? You could have a very righteous, godly king that's going to lead the people and enact good laws and, and follow the Lord, but the people are still just kind of still wanting to do their own thing, and they're suffering maybe the, the righteous king and, and, and going along with it just because he's in power, right? So... These are all points to keep in mind and consider because God's judgment still comes. You know, when you got all the people just being wicked, yes, you, you might have someone that can help stay things off or help try to turn the hearts of the people around. But if the people still continue to be wicked, they're still going to get their day and their judgment as a nation before the Lord. So uh, that's just, just a kind of a side note there to keep in mind. And what we're seeing here is the reference to God being angry and God's jealousy burning like fire. And we're, we're, we're seeing evidence that what's happening to the saints, to God's people, is a result of the people as a whole kind of turning away from the Lord. So this definitely strongly shows a prophecy of the events that would be with the destruction of the first temple uh, primarily, right? Because the second temple, I, didn't, I don't see a whole lot of evidence of, of believers really sticking around during that time. A lot of them had spread out from Jerusalem and were preaching the gospel to the, to the world and, and going out into the Gentiles and, and, and doing that type of ministerial work. Of course, I'm sure there were churches still established at Jerusalem, but by the time 70 AD rolls around, I don't think that's the, the, the focus of this, uh, these events that we're seeing here. Of course, there's parts I'm sure that could be applied to it, but it, it seems to be primarily on that destruction of the first temple. But all of that being said, let's look at, uh, keep your place here and turn if you go to Jeremiah chapter 14. And Jeremiah has a lot of prophecies about that, uh, the captivity, because he was the prophet, the last prophet, essentially, of that time that was alive and prophesying all the way up to and including the captivity. So he, he was there telling them all the while, even after, you know, the first time, just say, hey, you know, give up, let the, you know, don't fight against this. This is of the Lord. You can't win. Just, just allow this to happen and God will let you stay here and you'll be able to still play. You know, and it's like they, every time he was telling them what to do from God, they just kept doing the opposite. And then he's saying, okay, we're here now. Don't go into Egypt. And what do they do? They go into Egypt. He said, okay, now, you know, every time he's telling them what to do, they just keep doing the opposite until everything just has to get destroyed and people are just kind of wiped out and they get taken captive. But they let Jeremiah, of course, stay. So, um, but in any case, that's, that's the story of Jeremiah. But we're looking at Jeremiah chapter 14, who, who he definitely did a lot of prophesying of this captivity into Babylon. Let's start reading here in verse number 10. I want you to see some of the similarities of what we already just read in Psalm 79. Thus saith the Lord unto this people, thus have they loved to wander. They have not refrained their feet. Therefore, the Lord doth not accept them. He will now remember their iniquity and visit their sins. And loving to wander, you could say, well, is that talking about sin? I think that's wandering from the Lord. Yeah, of course that would include sin, but wandering from even being the people of the Lord and going after other gods, which is going to cause God to be jealous over his people. Verse number 11, then said the Lord unto me, pray not for this people for their good. When they fast, I will not hear their cry. And when they offer burnt offering and an oblation, I will not accept them, but I will consume them by the sword and by the famine and by the pestilence. 
Then said I, Ah, Lord God, behold, the prophets say unto them, Ye shall not see the sword, neither shall ye have famine, but I will give you assured peace in this place. Then the Lord said unto me, The prophets prophesy lies in my name. I sent them not, neither have I commanded them, neither spake unto them. They prophesy unto you a false vision and divination and a thing of naught and the deceit of their heart. Therefore, thus saith the Lord concerning the prophets that prophesy in my name, and I sent them not. Yet they say sword and famine shall not be in this land. By sword and famine shall those prophets be consumed. And this is... There's no new thing under the sun, and this is something that we always need to be aware of on a regular basis. You know, I think it's even easier for us probably to spot uh, the false prophets that are prophesying lies because we have all of Scripture to, to look to and to fall back on and, and just be able to say, look, if you're not preaching what this says, you're the false prophet. Even in the Old Testament, though, it was evidenced when, when things were being prophesied and it's like, when, when, uh, when people are going like, well, look, when is God prophesying good? And we've seen God prophesy bad before and it's come to pass. Like, maybe we ought to pay attention to this because this is how God, God operates in the warnings a lot more than just in the blessings. You know, when God is, is going to deliver, he does deliver, Absolutely. But you got to have your heart right with God. You got to have the people, you know, following the Lord. And when you can look around and see the evidence of people really having total disregard for the word of God. But then you have other prof prophets standing up and saying, oh, no, God's with us. God's blessing America. God's here. Whatever, you know, whatever they're saying, whatever country you're in. If you could look around and see, like, this is a godless society and no one really seems to care at all in general, and here's what's being promoted, and here's what's being pushed, and here's what this country is just putting out to everybody, but then they're saying, oh, no, we're great, we're, we're Christian, and we're with God's our God, and everything else, like, no, no. The, the prophet that's, pe that's preaching peace and how great our country is, we're going to be um, not uh, being experiencing the wrath of God is a fool and a false prophet. If he's not just a fool, he's a false prophet because we could read what the scripture says. I could look around and see the condition of the morality of the country as a whole and realize this is not anywhere close to the Bible. And even, you know, no nation is ever you know, perfect, but you can look at various nations. We could look at the nation of Israel. We could look at other nations who have followed the Lord, who have done works for Christ and have had their laws more in line. And yeah, every country, every nation is going to have wicked leaders and have problems and things like that. But there's a, there's a big difference between, you know, human sin and people just kind of not being great, but, but still saying, hey, we're going to follow, we're going to uphold this as being good and holy and righteous and of God versus the exact opposite, which is kind of the turn that we've taken in more recent generations and decades in our country from general consensus of people upholding and exalting the word of God to now a, a lot more people being disdainful of the word of God and reproachful over the word of God. And when you see that happen, we know that's when God gets angry and the people start to wander and they start going after strange flesh and doing weird things and vile perverted acts and that's what's being exalted well guess what judgment is not far away so in this day dead prophets that were prophesying lies and saying oh you know God's with us nothing's gonna happen don't worry about these Jeremiah's these people there are these mean hateful preachers that, uh, you know, that, that, that they just don't worry about what they have to say. They don't know what they're talking about. They don't know the love of God. There are these legalistic people. No. They're the ones that are literally saying this is what the word of the Lord says. But let's keep reading here. Look at verse number. Um, so God's saying, you know, they're saying there's going to be no sword and famine. And he's saying, you know what? That's funny because I'm going to make the sword and the famine consume them 
that the, exactly what they're saying isn't going to happen, I'm going to make that destroy them. Those very things. Verse 16, and the people to whom they prophesy. So not just the false prophets. Now he's talking about the people to whom they prophesy shall be cast out in the streets of Jerusalem because of the famine and the sword. Look at this. And they shall have none to bury them. So the people who are listening to the false prophets, who are uh, uh, the people who are loving to wander, which is what we saw in verse 10 of Jeremiah 14, that they're wandering, they haven't refrained their feet, they're going away from the Lord, they're listening to the false prophets that are tickling their ears with good things, that it doesn't matter how sinful you are, it doesn't matter how much you're breaking God's commandments and, and disregarding the word of the Lord, everything's going to be okay, you're going to have peace, everything's just fine. And not only is he going to destroy those false prophets, but also the people who are just going along with it. So they're going to be the ones that are cast out in the streets. They're going to be ones dying by the famine and the sword, and they shall have none to bury them. Them, their wives, nor their sons, nor their daughters, for I will pour their wickedness upon them. Let's keep reading here, verse 17, because this is the beginning of that, uh, what we see these, these similarities between Psalm 79 and Jeremiah. Look at verse 17. Therefore thou shalt say this word unto them, let mine eyes run down with tears night and day, and let them not cease. For the virgin daughter of my people is broken with a great breach, with a very grievous blow. If I go forth into the field, then behold the slain with the sword. And if I enter into the city, then behold them that are sick with famine. Yea, both the prophet and the priest go about into a land that they know not. Hast thou utterly rejected Judah? Hast thy soul loathed Zion? Why hast thou smitten us and there is no healing for us? We looked for peace and there is no good. And for the time of healing and behold trouble. So notice also the plea to God, very similar to the plea in Psalm 79, 5, how long, O Lord, are you going to be angry forever with us? And, and it's, it's a very similar sentiment being expressed here to the Lord about their, their judgment and about their punishment coming forth. We look for peace and there is no good and for the time of healing and behold trouble. Verse 20, we acknowledge, O Lord, our wickedness and the iniquity of our fathers, for we have sinned against thee. Do not abhor us for thy name's sake. Do not disgrace the throne of thy glory. Remember, break not thy covenant with us. Are there any among the vanities of the Gentiles that can cause rain? Or can the heavens give showers? Art not thou he, O Lord our God? Therefore we will wait upon thee, for thou hast made all these things. So now we see a repentant heart. We see them acknowledging their sin and acknowledging their wickedness in order to uh, get in God's favor again. Let's go back to Psalm 79 because we will see more similarities of, from what we just read there and finished reading in Jeremiah chapter 14. Verse number 6 of Psalm 79, Bible reads, Pour out thy wrath upon the heathen that have not known thee and upon the kingdoms that have not called upon thy name. For they have devoured Jacob and laid waste his dwelling place. Oh, remember not against us former iniquities. Let thy tender mercies speedily prevent us, for we are brought very low. And, and that statement there, verse number eight, we'll get back to verses six and seven in just a minute because it's also going to tie in with some more uh, in, in, in a few minutes here, but remember not against us our former iniquities. God, don't hold our sins of the past against us. We've sinned against you. They're acknowledging their sin, and they're saying, look, we're brought very low. And oftentimes, unfortunately, we have to be brought very low before we seek God again and seek his favor and seek his mercy and seek his forgiveness. It comes when people are brought very low. I just had a discussion with someone, I think it was on Saturday, out soul winning, talked to a guy uh, who was saved, gave all the right answers, solid testimony of salvation, and I was just asking him to explain a little bit about how he got saved and just was said, yep, I got, I got to a point where I was brought really low. 
in my life. And as you know what, I could, I could relate to that because I also got to a point where I was low in my life before I turned to the Lord to save me. Many people have very similar stories. Of course, everyone might have a different low that you might have sunk to before you turn to the Lord. And I would just uh, recommend for anyone listening, saved and unsaved alike, unsaved especially, look, turn to the Lord to save you before, without having to be brought down low. Now, anyone who has to be humbled and brought down really low, I pray that God will bring them down to whatever point they need to be at in order to put their trust in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And I'll pray that for any unsaved person, if, if their pride is too much and is in the way of them being able to call in the name of the Lord and just receive the free gift of salvation, hey, whatever is necessary, God, we want that to happen in their life. And it may, it's not a pleasant prayer necessarily for the person who might have to go through a significant loss in their life, but if it brings them to the point of being able to call in the name of the Lord, then at the end of the day, amen. I'd much rather go through the most difficult time on this earth and then end up getting saved as opposed to never having to experience trouble or problems or turmoil and going to hell forever. It's an easy trade. It's not, that's not even a, a question. So here they're mentioning, look, we are brought very low. They're brought low because of the judgment coming upon them. The Bible says in Proverbs 15, you don't have to turn there. Proverbs 15, 32, he that refuseth instruction despiseth his own soul, but he that heareth reproof getteth understanding. And the children of Israel here are getting reproved. They're being judged. They're being instructed against the ways that they had been turning and wandering from the Lord. And now they're getting instruction. It says, if you refuse instruction, you despise your own soul. Because if you can't learn by being instructed of the Lord, then he's going to have to keep on trying to teach you. And that's not the teaching that you want to have to keep on getting over and over and over again. It's like the kids that can't learn to clean up after themselves or do their school and you have to keep on teaching them what they need to do. It's not pleasant. It's better to learn the first time and then get that right, and then you don't need all that extra education. The Bible says you despise your own soul, but he that heareth reproof getteth understanding. The fear of the Lord is the instruction of wisdom, and before honor is humility. We need to humble ourselves. We need to be able to bring ourselves very low. You know, it's better to bring yourself low than it is for God to have to bring you low. You can be humble and, and humble yourself and bring yourself low without having to have any external forces upon you to bring yourself low. It's easier to bring yourself low when you have the external forces upon you. But again, let's, let's see ourselves and humble ourselves in our hearts, in our mind, in our spirit to be able to serve faithfully. And again, I, you know, I, I, I talked about the unsaved. Hey, humble yourself and accept that free gift. Humble yourself and don't think that you can just do everything yourself and you don't need a God. No, you need a Savior. You're a sinner. You need to be saved. But now I'll speak to the saved. Because God's salvation and God's deliverance, of course, there's one aspect of just being a saved and receiving eternal life, but you also need deliverance in this lifetime from other things, from other turmoils, from other obstacles, from other difficulties and struggles in this life you still need to be turning to God as your deliverer, as your savior on the day-to-day -day battles, on the other wars that you face. And guess what? He still wants you humble. <laughs> guess what? He still wants you to, to have, not to have a stiff neck, to be able to have your ear open and not to be lifted up in pride. And if you want God to raise you up and lift you up and help you up and exalt you, then you need to be low. You need to have humility. And before honor is humility. Verse number nine there in, in Psalm 79, the Bible says, Help us, O God, of our salvation for the glory of thy name and deliver us and purge away our sins for thy name's sake. Again, the, the humility brought before the salvation. Verse 10, Wherefore should the heathen say, 
Where is their God? Let him be known among the heathen in our sight by the revenging of the blood of thy servants which is shed. Now, I want to speak a little bit and, and spend a significant amount of time, probably the majority of the rest of the time tonight, just covering this topic or this subject of revenge. And we see here the plea and saying, why, why should, wherefore, should the heathen say, where is their God? So here's one of the arguments of God. God, why should the heathen, why should these unbelieving heathen be able to say, where is their God when they see us being trodden down, when they see us being destroyed, when they see all these bad things happen to us? Why are you going to give them the ability to say, where is their God? Because God, you are God. You are almighty. We know that you're God. We know that you're real. And they're mocking and they're despising and it's going to bring shame on your name, God. Why are you going to let them do this for so long? And they say, let, let him be known among the heathen in our sight. So they're asking, can you just make yourself be known so that they can't say, hey, where is their God? By the revenging of the blood of thy servants, which is, which is shed. They're saying, we want you to make yourself known by revenging our blood on them. They're seeking revenge from what the heathen were doing to them. And un unfortunately today, a lot of people say, well, that's not very Christian of them. But I would say this, it absolutely is, and there's nothing wrong with desiring revenge. But it, it, it is, the, the circumstances matter, okay? This does not imply that you can just always be seeking revenge for every single thing, every single infraction by any single person and just always be wanting to have revenge on people. That is not what I'm saying. But it's also untrue to say that you could never, ever have a desire for God to revenge certain things that are done against people. That is totally false. And people have gone too far in that direction of it to, to the point of even saying, well, such a thing is so unchristian. Look at verse number six there. We'll jump back. I said I was going to get back to this. They're saying, pour out thy wrath upon the heathen. So the request is, God, pour out your, your anger, your wrath on them. They're not praying for this people for good. Notice that. Pour out thy wrath upon the heathen that have not known thee and upon the kingdoms that have not called upon thy name. And, and why? Why would they do that? Because verse 7 says for, which means because they have devoured Jacob and laid waste his dwelling place. This is why. Because they're destroying your people, God. These wicked heathen are just coming in and destroying all of your people. And they're destroying the saints. And, and God, stand up for your people Deliver your people and pour out your wrath on the wicked heathen that are doing these things to your people. And there's nothing wrong with a prayer like this because guess what? This is a psalm of Asaph and Asaph is speaking as he's moved by the Holy Ghost. So this is the word of God. This isn't just Asaph and his feelings. He wasn't experiencing this. The destruction of the temple was yet to come. This is the Holy Ghost speaking to us. To every believer, through the word of God, this has power, this has authority. And if this is being expressed by the narrator of this psalm, we know this is true. This is biblical fact. Okay? And we're going to look at other examples here. Now, it mentions here the revenging of the blood of thy servants, which, which is shed. This concept is found all throughout Scripture, Going back to the law in the Old Testament, you don't have to turn. Turn, if you would, to Romans 13. But in Numbers 35, we see some, some of the law written about the revenger of blood. Who remembers reading about the revenger of blood? Yeah, I remember reading about that, right? So when someone kills somebody, when there's a murder that takes place, when someone loses a relative, loses a loved one, loses a family member, well, God's law 
dictated that a murderer, if someone, if it wasn't manslaughter, if it wasn't accidental, but there was a murder that took place, that the person who killed the other person is going to be put to death. That that is a capital crime, and they ought to receive the death penalty if they're found guilty. And that there is a person that's called the revenger of blood. And this is the person that is going to be the one to execute the judgment upon the one who took their family member. So it's going to be someone probably close of kin to the person, the victim. The victim that died, their dad, their brother, you know, their son is going to be the one to execute the judgment on the person who came and murdered their family member. And that is justice. Numbers 35, 19, just one verse about this, and you could read a lot about this in Scripture. The Bible says, The revenger of blood himself shall slay the murderer. When he meeteth him, he shall slay him. And God gave the authority for this to take place, that there is going to be a revenger of blood in the law. He gave this. Now, there are sanctuary cities so that the, the people could flee, so that they could get their day in court before the family member is able to just execute that judgment upon them. <coughs> God ordained that things would be done still decently and in order when murders would take place, that you could still have evidence and you could still prove people guilty and you have to have two or three witnesses in order for someone to be put to death and, and on and on. But the judgment against a murderer stands. And the method of that judgment here for a murderer would stand of there being a revenger of blood. Even in the New Testament, we have this, this same concept of there being a revenger of blood, even if it's not necessarily the next of kin. Look at Romans 13, verse number 3. The Bible says, For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. Wilt thou then not be afraid of the power? Do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise of the same, for he is the minister of God to thee for good. But if thou do that which is evil, be afraid. For he beareth not the sword in vain, for he is the minister of God, a revenger, to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. So Romans 13 is establishing or confirming, I should say, not establishing, it's confirming the power that God has given to human government that the reason why it exists and the reason why you have these rulers are to be able to execute judgment against evildoers. So you got people doing evil to other people. They need to stand and be judged, and then sentence needs to be carried out against them. So he's saying, look, this guy, and it says that that ruler is a minister of God. It's God appointed that there's somebody to revenge the blood, that there's someone to revenge the evil, that there's someone to bring justice, because that's what the revenge is. It's just bringing vengeance or bringing justice. Now, can people go over the top and do things that are not just because they're full of emotion and because they get really angry and they want to take out revenge? Absolutely, and that's not right to just go, oh, you're going to come at me with whatever and I'm going to go way over the top and I'm going to kill, you know, you killed one of my families or I'm going to kill two of yours, right? That's not right. That's not just. And this is what oftentimes people will think of when they hear the word revenge. And that, of course, that's not right. And it's not right also just to take the matters into your own hands either. That also isn't right. But just the concept of there being vengeance and there being revenge is not unchristian. We all ought to love justice and judgment. And you can still love a person enough to want them to be saved, to still try to get them the gospel, but still have respect that, hey, look, we're still a nation of laws and we ought to have judgment against evil people who do evil things. You know, people want to get all high and mighty. Like, well, if you put them to death, then it would, I mean, don't you want them to get saved? Like, yeah, I do want them to get saved. I want murderers to get saved. I want people who are guilty of capital crimes to get saved. I do. But I don't want to just say, well, just because I want to be saved, then we should just have no law. I mean, that's silly. That's just, I mean, it's ridiculous. Because, I mean, should we just throw away all laws? I mean, all judgments? I mean, who are you to judge? 
That's what that's what some people will say. It's it's mind boggling the ignorance and the foolishness that you could hear when people are against the death penalty. But if you apply the logic that many people use against the death penalty, it's like, well, then how can you have any argument for any law for any judgment, whether that be prison time, whether that be a fight like where do you draw the line? No, we have to have laws. We get what the proper judgment is from the Lord, from God, because he determines what's right and what's just. And I don't know about you, but I would be very happy to see judgment in our land and justice prevailing. If it was God's justice prevailing, I would love to see that. And Christian, you know, the Christian attitude would be like the Apostle Paul. Hey, look, if I did anything worthy or guilty of death, I, I'm not going to stop the, the sentence from being carried out. Like, like I'll die. I'll willingly, like, if, if you find me guilty of, of doing something worthy of death, I refuse not to die, right? Fine. That's justice. If I, if I commit some crime and I'm worthy of this punishment, then bring it on. It ought to be carried out. But it's wicked when you have people being persecuted and falsely imprisoned and falsely accused and you have all kinds of injustice going on. And the, the further away a people get from righteousness, from the Lord, the more you're going to see a lot of injustices happen. And that's another sign of the times where we see so much injustice going on around us. You see some of the most wicked people getting off with almost no punishment. And then you see people who do nothing being persecuted and cast into prison for decades. And that's starting to happen more and more and more. You've got to pay attention to what's going on out there. And I mean, it's getting crazy town crazy town right now there was someone and if it may, you may have heard about this maybe not there is someone that got thrown into prison and i don't know what the sentence is it's years multiple years for putting for posting like a meme on social media or just this little comment that said oh yeah democrats you can you can vote by text tomorrow or whatever, right? Something stupid that nobody would believe that wasn't intended to like be really deceitful and put out official looking documents to make people actually think that like, no, it was a social media posting and they got convicted and sentenced to prison for a post on social media that's a joke. And, you know, all the January 6th stuff and the people who literally just like some people didn't even enter the Capitol building and were just on the steps. Yep, throw them into prison. Didn't hurt anybody. Didn't do anything. Didn't really do anything. Was out at a protest, out at a demonstration, walked on steps or crossed a barrier, a line. Didn't hurt anyone. Didn't cause any problems. But being arrested and thrown in prison. This is what you see in third world countries. This is what you see in banana republics. This is what you see going on in heathen nations. Well, you know what? We're seeing it happen here. And there's so much more injustice going on. And, and it's happening on both sides of the fence is those who are guilty being let go, those who are wicked receiving almost no sentence, and those who aren't really doing anything but are opposing the wicked doers that are in power, that's where the, the sentence is coming in. And uh, it, this, isn't, this isn't political, this is reality. This is the results of a, of a wicked people that are now gonna be reaping what has been sown for so long. You can't just continue to, to push out uh, and pump out and endorse and tolerate and promote all manner of wickedness and not have repercussions for that. And God's judgment is coming. And I would say woe unto the believers who aren't standing with the word of God. That are getting sucked up in all the brainwashing and all the false prophets and all the, the people who are uh, 
going right along with the wickedness of this world. They're going to they're gonna have another thing coming. They're going to see the vengeance of the Lord. But going back to now looking at vengeance, all of that stemmed from wanting to see justice. We want to see judgment. We want it to be right. We want it to be righteous. When people break the law, they ought to receive a penalty that is appropriate for what they've done. Every human being wants to see that. And it's the really wicked people that don't want to have any punishments on anybody because they're guilty. Turn, if you would, to Ezekiel 25. I want to cover this, this passage here, and then we're going to look at another passage in Ezekiel. So the revenge, the revenge is just if it's revenging injustice, right? It, the, the right way, the proper way. This happened, here's the result. It's equal, it's even, it's appropriate. But revenging in despite and hatred and, and, and you know, adding more to it, that is when it crosses the line and when it's no good or when you're taking it just completely in your own hands. Look at verse number 14 of Ezekiel 25. The Bible says, And I will lay my vengeance upon Edom by the hand of my people Israel, and they shall do in Edom according to mine anger and according to my fury, and they shall know my vengeance, saith the Lord God. And this is God pronouncing his vengeance. And God has every right to bring vengeance upon anyone. As the Bible says, you know, I am the Lord, I will repay. God is the ultimate judge. He is the ultimate uh, one to bring in vengeance and, and be a revenger. And he's the one that we turn to. And as we saw in Psalm 79, that's what the psalmist is doing too. They're turning to the Lord for seeking revenge. God is carrying it forth here in Ezekiel 25. Look at verse number 15. Thus saith the Lord God, because the Philistines have dealt by revenge and have taken vengeance with a despiteful heart to destroy it for the old hatred. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, behold, I will stretch out mine hand upon the Philistines and I will cut off the Kirithims and destroy the remnant of the seacoast. So the Philistines were trying to bring forth vengeance, but he says, because they did it by revenge and have taken vengeance with a despiteful heart to destroy it for the old hatred, that was not right. That was not just. That vengeance wasn't just that the Philistines were trying to do. So he says, you know what? Now I'm going to step in. Verse 17 says, and I will execute great vengeance upon them with furious rebukes, and they shall know that I am the Lord when I shall lay my vengeance upon them. Flip over to chapter 33. Chapter 33 and verse number eight. Vengeance is ultimately the Lord's, but it is not sinful to ask the Lord for vengeance. And it is not, there's nothing wrong with your heart. And people might turn and use this passage in Ezekiel 33, but we're going to get this in context. What, what some people might say is in verse 11, Say unto them, As I live, saith the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. And some people might say, Well, see, God doesn't have any pleasure, so you shouldn't be seeking vengeance because God doesn't want those people to die. He wants them to live and to turn from their evil way. But let's get this in the context and see what, what is going on when God is even making this statement and what is this talking about, right? It, it's too easy to, to yank something out and just broad brush it to every situation, but you can't do that in Scripture. you got to look and see and discern what is being discussed here. Look at verse number 8. When I say unto the wicked, O wicked man, thou shalt surely die, if thou dost not speak to warn the wicked from his way, that wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood will I require at thine hand. Nevertheless, if thou warn the wicked of his way to turn from it, if he do not turn from his way, he shall die in his iniquity, but thou hast delivered thy soul. Therefore, O thou son of man, speak unto the house of Israel. Thus he speak, saying, If our transgressions and our sins be upon us, and we pine away in them, how should we then live? 
Say unto them, As I live, saith the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn ye, turn ye from your evil ways, for why will ye die, O house of Israel? This is the chance before the vengeance is going to come. This is the opportunity to get right with God. God doesn't want to have to bring the vengeance, but when you push it too far, he does. And you get the warning, and God would always prefer, and I think the right thing and the Christian thing is we would all rather prefer that instead of wicked people doing wicked things to God's people and bringing it to the point to where you're like, God, bring vengeance on us, I'd rather have those people never have done all those wicked things and not gotten to the point where people are calling out for that vengeance. This is what this is talking about. Let's, let's stop it before it happens. Let's get people to get right with God. Hey, that's the best. That's ideal. Everybody wins. Get right with God. But when that doesn't happen, guess what does happen? Judgment. And when people can't just let the believers alone, when the wicked people, when the heathen, when the evildoers can't just let you serve the Lord and, 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 and live your life and just have to bring uh, reproach and bring evil against you, then it's going to be time, you know, you're, you start off wanting to help, wanting to convert them, wanting to change their mind, you know, but at some point it's going to be like, okay, God, I mean, this is, they're just killing us. They're destroying us. We didn't do anything to them. Bring, that's when you seek the vengeance. And that's righteous. You can't just take this one verse and just say, nope. This just, this, because now what you're doing is contradicting. If that were to mean, nope, in every single situation, you could never ask for vengeance, then what, why is this all throughout Scripture then? Turn, if you would, to Revelation chapter 6. I'll read a couple passages for you while you're turning there. You're turning to Revelation 6, Psalm 58, verse number 10. The Bible says, The righteous shall rejoice when he seeth the vengeance. He shall wash his feet in the blood of the wicked. So that a man shall say, Verily there is a reward for the righteous. Verily he is a God that judgeth in the earth. It's a righteous thing to rejoice when God finally brings vengeance on people who are doing wicked things. And, and you know, it's funny because the hypocrites, oh, you're not very Christian, that's not great. They're all rejoicing. When you have these monsters in society that get put to death, people rejoice. And rightfully so. You can see the old clips and stuff of people you know, when there's these serial killers are being executed back when they used to do more executions like in this country, people actually got put to death. John Wayne Gacy, I mean, they were having some, like a party outside of the prison when he was set to be executed. Like people were cheering about it. Amen. They ought to. That guy was wicked as hell. He was some pervert, sodomite, psychopath, murderous, you know, weirdo, pedophile. Yeah, praise God that someone like that is like, justice is going to be carried out against him. It's a reason to rejoice. That's good. That's good for society. And that's healthy. And there's nothing wrong with, with being glad about that. Romans 12, 18, the Bible says this, and look, we, everything needs to be, of course, balanced and viewed properly. So when you have the extremely wicked people and people doing these wicked things and you seek vengeance against them, that's right. But at the same time, in general, we're not just like seeking vengeance over every little thing and trying to just have, you know, be so, oh, you did this and I want this to happen to you. And, you know, like, look, you, you got to know to have 
a, a, a good level of grace and mercy and long suffering, but there's always a point that gets crossed where then, okay, it's righteous to have vengeance. The Bible says in Romans 12, 18, you're in Revelation 6. Romans 12, 18 says, if it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. Right? We ought to have a heart of peace and a heart of love and, and, and long suffering and, and, and really desire and want to just get along and be at peace with everyone and not have strife. And look, if someone is going to come and, and take your cloak, you know, let, let them have your coat. Also, if someone wants to come and smite you, like, look, let them smite the other cheek too and have that type of a peaceful just attitude in general, right? But if someone comes and rapes and kills your daughter, okay, I'm going to be seeking vengeance. That's a little bit different than someone taking my coat. Like, fine, here. If it be possible as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves. It doesn't say don't seek vengeance. It just says avenge not yourselves. But rather give place unto wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. We trust that God will bring vengeance. We can ask God for that vengeance. We can seek that vengeance from the Lord. We just don't take those matters into our own hands. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. For in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. And yes, you can still be good and do good to that person and if it's necessary, God can bring the vengeance on them. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. And knowing when you're doing good, if they continue to do evil to you, that's just adding that much more judgment from the Lord upon them. That's why it says you're going to be heaping coals of fire on their head by doing nice things for people. Because the more unjustly you are persecuted, the worse it is, the worse of a crime it is, the worse it is for that person, right? So, I mean, if someone's doing wrong to you and you get in a fight with them and maybe you injure them or you hurt them, you, you, can, you can see it's un, more understandable the more wrong the other person is, right? But when someone's like not doing anything wrong, you know, it's like Brother Ricardo comes in and he's always offering, hey, Pastor Burzins, I got you some food. Today. Hey, Pastor Burzins, I did it. You know, he's just always doing nice things for me. And one day I'm just like, you know what? <laughs> and just clock them, right? Like, how wicked would that be and how wrong would that be? Like, he just continues to do nice things and I'm just doing evil to him. But now, on the other hand, he's, he's always coming in and, and just causing problems and trying to make everything real difficult for me and that same situation happens, it's, you know, it's, it's the, the balance isn't the same. But when God sees you being just really good, doing nothing wrong, nothing deserving, of, 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 you know, anything and, and the wicked doer doing the wickedly, then it's going to be that much worse for them. It's a, it's much, it's more severe punishment for them. And we need to put our trust that God will repay. But look at Revelation 6. I like pointing this out as well. Verse number nine, the Bible says, and when they had opened the fifth seal, and I made this point in the past. So if you've heard this before, just bear with me. And try to remember, you could, you could show other people if you ever come across this with someone. When he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. Now this is where, this hasn't happened yet. This is prophetic. This is the future. This is right before Jesus Christ comes back. And there are martyrs who appear in heaven that were slain for the word of God. These are saints that have been persecuted unto death for the cause of Christ. And this is taking place in heaven. That's the context of Revelation chapter 6. So do these people have their sinful flesh if they're in heaven before the Lord? No. They are standing before the Lord as saints, as martyred saints that were faithful unto death. And they cried with a loud voice saying, How long? Sounds familiar, doesn't it? How long, O Lord? Holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? Where is this sin coming from if it's sinful to be seeking the vengeance of wicked people doing wicked things to you and oh, how unchristian that is? These are born again saints in heaven with no sinful flesh asking for the vengeance of their blood upon those wicked people that were still on the earth. 
There is nothing wrong with seeking that type of vengeance from God upon evil, wicked people in this earth. There's nothing wrong with that. But we need to put our trust that God brings that vengeance, not us. It is his job to do that, not ours. God will bring the vengeance. God brings the justice. We can, that is one theme you continue to see throughout Scripture. It is the, turn, the saints turning to God. How long, God? Will you judge God? God bring vengeance. You'll see that in the Psalms. There's imprecatory prayers. There's multiple times in Psalms. It's always entreating the Lord for the vengeance. It's not the believer taking the matters into their own hands. God knows and sees all. And God hears your cries and he'll hear your prayers. Verse 11 says, and white robes were given unto every one of them. Oh, except for the ones that were seeking vengeance, right? No, all of them. And it was said unto them that they should rest yet for a little season until their fellow servants also and their brethren that should be killed as they were should be fulfilled. And God's saying, no, look, I know you were killed and I know it was unjust, but you know what? It had to happen and we got to wait actually a little bit longer because there's more people that still need to die and then I'm going to bring judgment. And God already knows about and God had the plan. So they had to just wait a little bit longer for the vengeance. And that could be the hard point too for people who have had bad things or wicked things done to them waiting on God's timing. But you know what? You have to have the faith to rely on the Lord that his timing is right. And just trust that he will deliver and he will take care of business. Because he will. Because God, I mean, if you don't think that, are you saying that God is unjust? And, and, and ask yourself that seriously. Is God unjust? Of course not. God knows all things. God is justice. God brings justice. We wouldn't even know justice without the Lord. Let's go back to Psalm 79. There's a few verses left. Verse number 11. Let the sighing of the prisoner come before thee. According to the greatness of thy power, preserve thou those that are appointed to die. The sighing of the prisoner is like the, the, again, the complaint, but not complaining in the way that we think of like murmuring, but the, the, the expression of the prisoner being in prison and wanting to be free. You know, that's the, the sighing of the prisoner coming before the Lord and uh, preserving those that are appointed to die. Verse 12, and render unto our neighbors sevenfold into their bosom their reproach, wherewith they have reproached thee, O Lord, seeking more of the vengeance from God saying, you know what, turn their wickedness on their head times seven. So we, thy people, and the sheep of thy pasture will give thee thanks forever. We will show forth thy praise to all generations. Trust in God, trust in his deliverance, trust in his justice and his judgment. He's always right. And we ought to praise God Every time, especially when we see God's judgment come through, even in these wicked times, God sees all, God knows all. Judgment will come one day. Let's bow our heads, have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you so much for uh, the great truths found in Scripture. I pray that you would please encourage us and help us through whenever we face difficult times of uh, injustices that may seem like they never go, that they seem they go unpunished and they never receive proper judgment. Lord, we know that you see all things and you ultimately will bring uh, judgment, whether it be in this lifetime or whether it be for souls that, that suffer in eternity in hell. God, I pray that you would please help us to uh, never take matters into our own hands, but that we would entrust uh, vengeance to you because that belongs to you and that you will repay. Dear Lord, we could seek um, the government authorities to, to help to step in when appropriate and uh, the revenger of blood here that you've ordained in this earth. And, and ultimately, though, Lord, that we could just go to you for all of our cares and all of our um, problems. And God, we, we thank you for your justice and, and for being a good God. And Lord, we just pray that you would help us to do right and uh, have the right balance in our, in our lives and our hearts. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.